On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Funding also provided by John Paul and Eloise DeJuria. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. In this week's On Story, a conversation on reimagining stories with ghost screenwriter Bruce Joel Rubin, Snow White and the Huntsman scribe Evan Doherty, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory's John August, and Twins screenwriter Herschel Weingrad. There's ways to do it where you're not trampling on the original, you're taking an established idea that works and you're tweaking it and you're and you're and you're making it a new in a different kind of setting with different kinds of things going on and it's fine this episode our panelists discuss how to keep stories fresh while remaining faithful to the original film I think talking just specifically about reimaginings, my goal from the beginning, I mean, the, the core concept was to try to take what's a sort of six page fairy tale uh, and make it an action adventure movie. So, you know, having the Huntsman be a, a main character and having it be sort of a two hander between Snow White and this very obscure small character from the fairy tale, bringing him up in the story enables you to have sort of a very strong female lead and a very strong male lead. It's kind of like, Luc Besson's The Professional, you know, uh, meets Snow White. Huntsman sort of trains Snow White to be a kind of hardcore individual like him so that she can then come into her own, become queen, and take vengeance on the, on, on the evil queen. And use their strength against them. You're small, so wait until they're close. And you drive it through their heart to the hilt. You understand? Do not hesitate. And you look in their eyes and do not pull it out until you see their soul. When I was doing Ghost and I didn't know what I was doing, uh, I went to see a production of Hamlet just by chance. And uh, in the second scene is Hamlet's father on the parapet, the ghost of his father, saying, avenge my death. And I went, wow, there's my, there's my movie. It wasn't Hamlet, obviously, but it was really that dictum of go out and avenge my death and what is it? What happens to somebody, or even today, if a ghost tells you to do something? It's an interesting story, and, and that's all I needed was that to go forward and find what I was trying to do. When you're dealing with a property where people are familiar with certain things, sometimes you can use that as a structure to help get through it. Like Charlie's Angels as a TV show, it worked perfectly well as a TV show, but the, the role between private life and personal life had to change for the movie version. But in our early conversations and in the early reimagining of it, it was just me and Drew sitting around saying, you know, we need to let the girls be really good when they're on the job, but really giant dorks when they're off the job, because dorks are funny. Dorks allow for comedy, and the cool people don't allow for comedy. And so we had to figure out sort of like, what are the angels like when they're off the case? Like, how do we build all that into the movie. So that was part of the initial conception way before we had a plot for, for Charles Angels is what is the world and the universe of this movie. The late Ray you know, Bradbury said, you find out what your hero wants and then you follow them. You don't lead them. You follow them and that's where that element of surprise comes because now I can follow them and then your unconscious comes into place and you're like writing automatically. If you know where you're going before you start out, don't take the trip. It's not worth it. Why go somewhere you know where you're going to end up? Start a trip without knowing, be as 
in the adventure that your character is in. I remember when I was writing Ghost and I wrote Molly and Sam are kissing at the end and, he, and Sam says to Molly, I love you. And he, would never, he was never able to say that before. I love you, Molly. I've always loved you. Molly looks at him and goes, ditto. That was always Sam's line. And the moment she did that, I broke out sobbing. I didn't know she was going to say that. Ditto. And what happens with people watching the movie and you now the show, the Broadway show, they break out crying. I mean, if you watch Finding Nemo, you know, how does a fish get out of a fish tank, get into the ocean again, you know, and find its father? How, do, how, how does it happen? You want him desperately to find his father, and it's not possible. And then you watch the most miraculous and exciting series of events that start to make the impossible possible. That's a good movie. It's a great movie because you as an audience are so engaged and so want this thing to happen. And you are thwarted just like the character is thwarted until the very last moment. And at the very last moment, you do think it's all over. And what do you do? You kind of reach into the ether. You reach into prayer. You reach into whatever it is you can find and say, help me through this. And something happens. Something comes. The, 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 the inevitable takes place. Dad, I know what to do. Nemo, no! no! You're right. I know you can. Lucky Finn! Now go! Hurry! Help all the fish to swim down! So here's the problem. How do you keep the audience from the moment the thing you want is taken away until the moment it's delivered involved? And basically, you just keep pulling the carpet out. If you go and see Argo, I don't know if any of you have seen Argo yet. These, um, these like, like really frightened Americans hiding out in the you know, Canadian ambassador's house are saying, no, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to be a Canadian cameraman. It's, it's theater of the absurd. What are our chances? Chances are good. Good? Well, what's the, uh, what's the number value of good? 30% chance of being publicly executed? Well, 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 we we all, we all can you tell me what the objection yeah, was to normal cover identities? There, has to be more there are no Canadians in the country for normal reasons. Yeah. They'll sniff the, us uh, out regardless. The Swedish consul, they, they accused him of being an American at the airport. They held him for an hour. That is Finding Nemo and all those things. And even though we know it's a true story, we, we know he got them out. The obstacles and the stops and the starts and the absurdity and the impossibility of the whole venture is so great. It's incredible. The challenge in Brewster's Millions um, was it was a novel, it was a play, it was a silent movie with Fatty Arbuckle. They made it in England with a woman. The last one they made was in 1945 where a guy comes back from World <clears throat> War II. So obviously it needs to be updated. But basically what they wanted was the concept of somebody who's very, very poor, inherits an obscene amount of money, and can't tell anybody about it, and has to spend a certain amount of money to get the rest of the money, but can't say why he's doing it. So it's, that's a question of updating. Walter Hill became involved, and then Richard Pryor became involved. And Walter Hill has a, like a big baseball Jones, and, and, and he said, I'd rather it be a kind of a wash up baseball player. And Richard Pryor said, I definitely would be interested in doing that. So then we went back and rewrote it for him. And what Richard Pryor did uh, to his credit was he said, look, I don't want you to write me black dialogue or I don't want, this is not gonna be like my, like my stand up stuff. I don't want it to be like my movies with Gene Wilder. I don't want race to be a part of this at all. I just want this guy to be a guy who's always wanted to pitch for the Yankees, which was great. You know, when you're dealing with any sort of adaptation or, you know, reimagining means that people are familiar with some part of the source material, um, there's always that pressure to be faithful to what the original one did. And so, um, you know, you look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, everyone who was familiar with either the original movie or the book knew that they were going to be certain set pieces, and they knew that things were gonna ha bad things were going to happen to Veruca Salt. I remember my experience of reading uh, Roald Dahl's book and thinking like how lucky Charlie Bucket was because he lived in this little house with all this whole family that he loved. And so, sure, he was poor, but like everyone loved him and everything was great. And poor Willy Wonka was stuck in the, this shut, shut, up, shut down in this factory with these crazy Oompa Loompas. With that in mind, 
I switched the roles of hero and uh, protagonist and antagonist, and that um, Charlie Bucket, the little perfect Charlie Bucket, is the antagonist who's forcing Willy Wonka to change. And so once I knew what those engines were, I had a lot of latitude to sort of get the story up and going. I wanted to write a movie about a guy who was dead and didn't know it. And so I'm sitting there in a state of, I mean, sweat, because I needed to write this movie, but I had no inkling about how to do it. And then all of a sudden, the recollection of a movie called Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge hit me. It's about a guy who is in the Civil War. I'm going to ruin this for you if you want you to close your ears. But he's in the Civil War, and, and he is captured, and they're going to hang him. And he's hanging off the edge of the bridge. And as he's hanging, as he's about to, I mean, as they're about to throw him off the edge of the bridge. And just as the rope is about to catch, it snaps. And he falls into the river, and he starts swimming for all he's worth. And they're firing guns at him, and he runs into the woods. And he's running and running, and you see a woman on a porch waiting. And suddenly he breaks through this big forest into a meadow, and at the far end is the house where he lives. And his wife sees him, and he sees her, and they're running together, and they're running together. And just as he's about to give her a big hug, his head goes like that, and the rope catches, and he's killed on the bridge. And you realize that the whole thing took place in a snap second on the bridge. And I thought about that, and I said, oh my god, I'm writing the feature version of Currents at Owl Creek Bridge. We're all stealing from other material, whether you do an absolute reboot or whether you just take elements from it. It's gone. And I look at writing for me. I know I'm not, I'm not everybody's writer, but I, I find myself totally unable to create a movie on my own. When I've tried, they're terrible. I find if I can reach for something unexplainable, ineffable, and it almost always arises or, or arrives, that the story comes and tells you where to go. Uh, hi, my name is Spencer Harvey, and this is my brother Lloyd Harvey, and we are the co-writer and directors on the short film Jack and Jill. We came up with the idea for Jack and Jill um, because we wanted to explore the realms of imagination from a child's perspective and ultimately why a child uses their imagination um, to connect with their reality. So we, we then took that idea of imagination and put it into the, uh, the Jack and Jill nursery rhyme which we all know and have grown up with. So we, we put these kids into a, a situation where they'll have to use their imagination, I guess, as an escape mechanism or to create a more beautiful world than the one they were living in. As a filmmaker, you always hope that the audience takes away something from your film. And um, I guess with Jack and Jill, we hope that the audience can relate to the simplicity of a little girl going through a rite of passage. And even if they have to look within their own timeline, because mm. I think that's what ultimately mm. we want people to do is see themselves reflected in the story and if they can find and find that moment within their own lives and and sort of pinpoint and feel that defining moment again. Coming up is our short film Jack and Jill. Thank you for watching. Exactly. Just let her read. It says here, Japanese air raids attacked small forces of Australians entrenched on a hill near Muba village in New Guinea. Isn't that the village from his letters? Let her finish. Army reports confirm that RAAF squadrons took considerable casualties. Oh, God. He wasn't listed as a casualty. They haven't listed since last Friday. Now, we won't know until... Shh. You're not supposed to be out here, Jilly. Go back up to the house and play. We should have had a letter from Father by now. Let's not jump to conclusions. Are we just supposed to wait? Yes, wait. And do our best to keep Mother from reading the papers.
balcony? No. Wait. New Guinea's very far away, you know. You can't hardly reach there by plane. Then how can I get there? A boat should do it. Just like yours. Sir, have you seen him? He's not here. Where is he? Stay behind. Didn't he, lads? Stay behind.
Excuse me, ladies. I'm looking for Mrs. Langham. Mrs. Langham was our caretaker's wife. She, she passed away more than a year ago. My apologies. Does she have any living relatives? Uh, her son. We've been looking after him whilst... was his father. Thank you.